Good evening, everybody. Uh, to anybody visiting from Wales. Happy St. David's Day. And uh, it's a great joy to see so many of you here this evening. Thank you to all of our friends and members whose faith in live classical music makes these awards possible, particularly this year's principal sponsors and supporters, BBC Radio 3, the ABRSM, PRS for Music, Yamaha, and BBC Music Magazine. And thank you to the trustees and the council of the Royal Philharmonic Society for their year-round dedication, and to James Murphy and the staff for all they have put into this event. And an occasion, an occasion like this allows us to send a message to government that we must cherish our proud musical heritage. It's been a traumatic few years for live music and the past six months have made many of us question just how much we are valued. Many colleagues are exhausted and small wonder as we head off crisis after crisis. But let's not lose hope a long view is necessary. Think of the period since 1900. Our four nations' musical life has survived world wars, terrorism, pandemics, and economic meltdowns because audiences wanted it to survive. There is still a palpable hunger for live classical music from an increasing cross-section of society. A century ago, many of our treasured ensembles and musical organizations didn't yet exist. Against the odds, exciting new ones are emerging yet. We are learning rapidly how to embrace digital platforms, and Generation Z is listening to classical music more than ever before. The RPS Awards shortlist from Aberdeenshire's Sound Festival to Leeds Piano Trail uh, to Wales' Tredegar Town Band are a tremendous portrait of music enlivening the nation. Yet there's a current tension between the music profession and some of its key funders with mistrust and misunderstanding on both sides. The industry feels sometimes that we're being instructed to dilute the quality of what we have to offer. Richard Morrison commenting on the arrival of the 12th culture secretary in 13 years suggested that she, she should bang heads together at Arts Council England, as there seems to be an ideological crusade against core classical music at that address. In preparing these words for tonight, I have sought opinions from many in our community. I have recorded their anxieties and engaged in a constructive dialogue with ACE about the strength of feeling and palpable difficulties moving forward. I've relayed huge concern about the fragility of the cultural ecology and the current state of music in the classroom. Don't get me wrong, industry leaders appreciate the core principles of Let's Create, ACE's 10-year ACE's strategy. We know some of it is long overdue, and perhaps some of our criticisms are unnecessary. After all, ACE is just as happy to back the magnificent multi-story orchestra or the exciting Manchester Collective alongside major concert halls or orchestras. However, unfortunately, there are deep fears. The pressures on defunded organizations have already made headlines, and let's not overlook those who never had public funding in the first place, nor the many organizations supported for now, but already worrying about the criteria they must fulfill by the next funding round. Another worry is that London, until now, remained one of the world's cultural jewels, and for the entire nation to prosper, we need London to prosper. The levelling up agenda needs to support equitable investment in culture across the UK, but not to London's detriment. Post-pandemic, as our cultural organisations pivot their business models to radically changing audiences' habits in terms of attendance and philanthropy, there is concern nationally that nobody is listening to us. There is huge pressure on individual donors and trusts are greatly stretched with every charitable and social cause asking for their help. It seems strange that there has been no refresh or adaptation of the Let's Create plan 
to embrace this new landscape and the related headwinds we all face. It's interesting to reflect on the words of John Maynard Keynes, the first Arts Council chair in 1945. He said, the task of an, of an official body is not to teach or to censor, but to give courage, confidence, and opportunity. Do not think of the Arts Council as a schoolmaster. The artist cannot be told their direction. They lead us to fresh pastures and teach us to love and to enjoy what we often begin by rejecting. Stirring words, but too often policymakers today regard artists as creatives who can be mobilized to fulfill criteria imposed upon them. Artistic excellence is not something that we should be ashamed to champion. We shouldn't have to think twice about saying that Bach, for instance, was a colossus and that his music represents some of the greatest triumphs of human imagination. But in the current funding climate, statements like that seem to be less than welcome or worse still, even irrelevant. Of course, we need greater financial commitment from government, but classical music is not simply looking to the future with a begging bowl. We showed through the pandemic that we are central to the well-being and the prosperity of our national life. The NHS and care providers increasingly draw on musicians to help in the comfort and recovery of people living with physical and mental health conditions, like Manchester Camerata, whose dedication to people living with dementia, recognized on tonight's shortlists, is emblematic of so much activity like this nationwide. The arts are central to the international standing, character, and well-being of the nation, and bring in over 110 billion pounds annually to the economy. Looking elsewhere, Berlin, a single city, gets cultural funding of around 600 million euros, while the annual ACE NPO budget is 428 million. Charlotte Higgins aptly calls this funding a thin gruel that organizations are forced to beg for. And speaking of gruel, we all remember Eat Out to Help Out, that subsidized restaurants during the pandemic. That cost some 849 million pounds for one month alone. If any government, current or future, addresses this awful cost of living crisis by subsidizing the hospitality sector, the arts should get a similar deal. At the very least, the government should look for new tax incentives, which would encourage individual donors to give more effectively to the causes that they love. So how can we best make our case in the current economic climate and amid so much global turmoil? Let's spell out what an ideal world would look like. All young people are passionate about music and all types of music. Schools are facing many similar challenges to the cultural sector. We need to understand those challenges and address how we can all work together. It's critical that we talk to young people and listen to their words. We need to highlight the importance of music education and music literacy. The music of Beethoven, Britain, or Caroline Shaw should be taught alongside the likes of Shakespeare, Austen, or Bernardine of Aristo. We need to renew our call to government to embrace the idea of a universal offer like there is for literature. Rather than attack, which doesn't get the classical music world very far, could we not come up with a united, tangible, and supportive suggestion from the sector? We should call for every primary school child to have the opportunity to attend many musical performances, to familiarize themselves with music history, an instrument, or to sing in a choir. I admire the rounded educational model so well embedded in our neighbors in Finland. Their Arts Testers program supports children to attend live performances. Prime Minister, it's not all about maths. We need to put our hearts and souls into England's refreshed national plan for music education and similar plans in Scotland and in Wales. Although many schools, music education hubs, and national youth music organizations do fantastic work, the days of free music education for all children throughout their schooling are largely gone, and investment in the whole system in real terms is now at an all-time low. 
Numbers of students taking GCSE and A-level music exams have dipped, but those taking grade exams have increased. This would indicate that those who can afford to go to, to private are making their own arrangements. Music is becoming the preserve of the middle classes, exactly the opposite of what Let's Create is meant to achieve. The government will say there is more money for the arts than before, and we're leveling up with inclusion and community front and centre. There is over £100 million going into music education with £25 million for instruments, but it's only around half of what's really needed. Yet all the education work we undertake in opera houses, festivals and concert halls, including events for schools and families, could be beamed at very little cost into every classroom or indeed every home across the country. A coordinated plan for live classical music and music education from government led by each of the nation's artistic funders is long overdue. Classical music policy and strategy is confused and all over the place, but our amazing resources and talents could work wonders if properly harnessed. In the pandemic, everyone recognized and endorsed the remarkable uplifting effects of music for people of all ages and all backgrounds. From that, the industry has begun to construct a new narrative to embrace great artistic expression from everybody. We should work with all funders to recognize that no artist is formed in a vacuum. It takes a community to develop a musician and we often neglect to acknowledge our own humble influences. We all have our own stories. My personal gateway to classical music, music was the Limerick Church Choir that I joined as a child. Those early experiences are so formative. If we lose focus on those crucial school years, there's little hope for meeting any diversity target 10 or 20 years down the line. It simply won't happen, and the pressure is now being placed on classical music organizations and their overworked learning departments to fix what is essentially a systemic problem in the classroom. The Venezuelan conductor Rafael Pérez's recent triumph with the Royal Opera's Barber of Seville reminded me that he only discovered music as a 14-year-old. We have to create opportunities at each and every stage of people's lives. We reach hundreds and thousands of children as an, as an industry, but millions more are disenfranchised simply because of a lack of joined-up thinking. I spoke to John Wallace, the great musical crusader of Scotland last week, on the day after the Scottish government U-turn on some proposed funding cuts, although Dundee Council didn't seem to get the memo. And I asked him what lay behind this. Music runs deep through our Scottish veins, he said, and we have managed to convey our message with passion and remind our politicians, local and national, emphasizing what was at stake. Now we are all working together on making the most of what we've got. He added, that when he met the late Queen as the final recipient of her medal for music just a few weeks before she died, she told him that she also believed every child should learn a musical instrument. Music's worth has never been clearer. Just look at tonight's shortlists. They represent an army of music makers ready to give even more of their remarkable talents for the benefit of society but we all lose out when we have to fight to justify their worth. We need open, honest, and reasoned dialogue now with government and with funders. Following my Sunday Times interview this week, which some of you might have seen, I was very heartened when the Minister of State for Schools, Nick Gibb, asked to meet with me. He seemed genuinely engaged and passionate about music in the classroom, and he reminded me that he was supportive of the Classical 100 resource developed by ABRSM. He wants to meet again, and I hope the conversation between him and other key stakeholders will continue in the months ahead. But regardless of any minister, let's get music in the classroom into every party's manifesto for the next general election. And my final message, don't be scared about speaking out. I am but one voice and the RPS one institution. As I prepare this speech, Many told me 
that the industry often feels suppressed by a culture of fear. That has to stop. We cannot be afraid of speaking up when something is clearly not working or plainly wrong. So all of you, please join the conversation and say the things that need to be said. Together, we can create strategies that we all believe in, that draw the very best from our brilliant musicians to rebuild the nation's spirit, its identity, and its pride. Thank you very much for bearing with me through that very long speech. <laughs>